All right, the persistence and spread uh, of populism is something that's quite interesting. Um, it's certainly a flare up in, in quite a few countries, but in many other countries, it's something left or right that seems to settle in and kind of spread across the, the entire political landscape. Some scholars even argue that its presence today is much more multifaceted than uh, just through the rhetoric and the electoral power of actual populist parties and leaders. And it's something that's kind of trickling down to other political actors, becoming much more firmly embedded uh, across our political systems. Uh, certainly in large part because of that, um, a lot of research is being done uh, studying the relationship between populism and democracy. And there's a lot of in interesting uh, stuff already out there uh, and being done at, the, at the, this very moment. So today I'm, I'm joined by uh, Christian Schimpf and Robert Huber, two very distinct and notable colleagues and scholars who have worked on exactly this uh, topic. And we're gonna take a little bit of time to kind of discuss their various collaborations on that particular uh, topic. So Christian and Robert, uh, let's start with a rather kind of general or generic question that's nonetheless very important. What is actually the relationship between uh, populism and democracy? And perhaps in answering these questions uh, or question, you could also give us a sense of, of what each of those two essentially contested concepts really mean to you. Absolutely, Stephen. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So let's start with the definitions of the two core terms before diving into how these two concepts are related to one another, right? So in our research, we always followed uh, ideational approach to understand populism as a set of ideas, right? And I mean, listeners to this podcast or to this video series are quite familiar with, with, with this definition, I guess, right? So there is an element of anti-elitism as one component of populism and there's a dimension of the will of the people, the homogeneous group that's uh, upright and good. And depending on which stream of the literature you follow, there may be a Manichaean outlook or the popular sovereignty as a, a third component. But overall, this is very much in the classic sense of what, what Kirk Hawkins has been working on or what, what Cass put forward almost 20 years ago, even, right? What's really important for the study of populism and democracy is to be well aware about the, the components of populism, right? It's really important to distinguish what is populism and what's maybe a co-constituent term as Bonnikovsky called it in his 2017 uh, paper. And clearly there's a debate about which features of populism actually drive the relationship with democracy. For example, Paul Kenny, recently strongly advocates for a strategic approach to populism rather than an ideational approach when we study the relationship of these parties with democracy. And his argument here, for example, is that there is an almost even tautological relationship if we define populism as something being somewhat illiberal and then we contrast this democracy. It's kind of obvious how those two things relate. We may, however, at the same time, um, reflect on whether the strategic setup or the organizational features of populist parties really drives how they relate to populism, right? Is having a strong leader figure in the party, for example, really something that relates to how, pop, uh, how democracy should work or not? And for us, it was always quite plausible to focus on the core features of the ideology underlying populism and not the organizational features, for example. So for, for us, it was always quite clear that uh, populism as a set of ideas relates to liberal democracy, but not necessarily how the parties organize. Uh, and I think this is a, a clear strength of the ideational approach for comparative research. Um, Christian, do you want to, to uh, briefly tap into democracy and how we define this in our work? Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks, Stephen, for, for organizing this and for having us. Um, yeah, so when we talk about the, the relationship between populism and democracy, the, the, there's a few distinctions that we certainly must make. And as Robert already alluded to, uh, most of the time when we talk about populism, it seems to be sort of 
um, risen, you know, as as an opponent to to liberal democracy, the liberal democracy, which seems to be sort of the standard that most people thought so early nineties that that's what we're just going with. But it seems maybe there there is some alternative. So if you survey the literature or also in our own work, um, usually what what uh, populism seems to oppose those those set of ideas. Is, is a former liberal democracy or also a representative democracy, which you know, in, in some some form or shape could go together. So why, why is populism opposed to it? Well, because populism rejects the notion of representation. Um, there should be an unmediated implementation of the will of, of the people, it's sort of a core idea. But representation is obviously the very core of representative democracy, which is uh, why, why scholars like Karmani would argue, well, populism is sort of opposed to to party representation system. And more importantly, uh, populism rejects the keys to liberal democracy. Uh, what's liberal democracy? Well, at the very core, power cannot be absolute um, and we must have pluralism, but populism very much conceives of the people as a homogenous group um, and only and only the people's will should be implemented. Henceforth, the two seem to be, seem to be um, sort of at, at opposing ends. Uh, there's some earlier work also by Riker uh, I had uh, something or, or reading we'd, we'd recommend everyone to, to read. It's called Liberalism versus Populism, in which populism is more or less a, a glorified version of a majoritarian democracy, which then also makes it a bit clearer why it's opposed to liberal democracy, because there's there's also minorities that need to be heard. Uh, that being said, so going going from this, going from this, uh, not everyone agrees. Uh, uh, because if you sort of follow what, what we say here, then, then populism is not really anti-democratic per se. It's either sort of an alternative idea, uh, whether it's a regime, to, a, sort of a or democratic regime, that's that's to be discussed. But there's scholars like Orbanati who would say that, that populism is actually much more, and it's um, almost a form of fascism, uh, because pluralism is actually a necessary condition for democracy. And if you subscribe to that view, then by implication, populism cannot be cannot be democratic. Um, but overall, if, if we think about populism, it's sort of the forms of democracy that we all seem to subscribe to, or at least many countries have adopted, then it's really sort of a struggle between the populist ideas and sort of some of the core pillars of, of liberal and representative democracy. All right, and I want to kind of tap into this a little bit more and really kind of dive into this this very specific relationship that populism has with let's say liberal democracy a lot of the scholarship kind of highlights especially if you follow the ideational way of thinking highlights that you know populism can be both like a, a good or a bad for democracy it can have a, a positive or a negative effect on, on uh, liberal democracy can you maybe elaborate a little bit on, on how exactly that that can be the case Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, clearly, is it a threat or is it a corrective, right? In the, the famous 2012 book by Bekas Mude and uh, Christopher Rodriguez Caldwell, so even used this as a title, if I remember correctly, right? But this hasn't always been the case. Uh, and maybe it's important to briefly understand where the literature was before this book, actually, right? And initially, and, and Christian also tapped into this a bit already, in talking about uh, populism and, and democracy, there have been either positive or, or negative visions of democracy. These claims that populism is ultra democratic in, in terms of the importance of the majority rule and uh, implementing the people's will, this has a very democratic notion. But then on the other hand, we have uh, authors such as Rubinati, but also others who are substantially more skeptical, right? This is the Preface or pre step to fascism, or is it per se illiberal and thus uh, anti democratic to some extent? So uh, these two views existed in the literature for quite some time. With Canavan's piece in 99, and then even more so with, with uh, Mudder and uh, Roberto Kalkbasser's book, we see more of this dual role. So that there is a bit of a struggle in, in liberal democracy. Um, in, in, in the way that we, on the one hand, have this pragmatic style, how, that's how Canavan kind of calls it, so how institutions mediate conflict and, and uh, ensure a proper working of government. 
But then on the other hand, we have this redemptive version, right, where it's government for the people, by the people, and um, of the people, right? So um, cl clearly, there has been this, this trade off in the past. And, and particularly then, if we look more into the mother book, we, we get a better sense of, of this. Um, yeah, and I just want to pick up on this and talk a bit more about the Muda book. I mean, essentially, what uh, what, what Kass and Chris will argue is that what we need to understand is whether populists are in power or not, because if you conceive of populism as sort of a, a set of ideas that maybe maybe that goes far, but it's sort of an alternative regime to liberal democracy, or at least an alternative version of how we you know, how we should aggregate preferences, how we how we should govern the state. Uh, then, then what's important is whether or not they're in government, because if they're given the chance, uh, if they have the powers of the government, they can, they can implement or they, they, they could change the law or they can possibly even change the constitution, depending on how much, um, how much vote or, or how much support they get from, from the voters. Um, so the idea that, that Cass and Chris will argue for is that if the populists are in power, then on average, they have a a negative effect for liberal democracy or unliberal democracy, or at least the trade-offs are, 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 are greater. Um, and this is something that you know we've seen or we currently see in, in Hungary or Poland, where there's lots of mingling with the judiciary, limiting the judiciary, but also implementing laws to limit the press freedom. Um, but on the other hand, they also argue that if populists are merely on opposition, they actually can have positive effects. They can increase mobilization. They might pick up on issues that are important to voters that other parties have previously not touched on um, and sort of bring important segments of, of, of the population back into the, the realm of politics, which whether you agree with, with their positions or not, ultimately this is how we've decided how we think in a, in, in a society, we should sort of, you know, we should discuss our issues and then come to come to a solution. Um, and this is also, at least at some of the empirical work that Robert and I have done, that what we find in, in Latin America and in Europe that this this holds. Um, all of this is to say um, there have been also newer empirical studies that, for Europe, for instance, or well, not just Europe, but in a, in a broader comparative context, also go into a bit more detail um, by Juan and Boxler. And um, they also find that populist parties in opposition can have negative effects. But maybe this is taken up a point that, that, that Muda and Rubio Calvasa haven't really touched on in their book, and that's that populist parties also can have indirect effects. They might affect policy even just by being a strong opposition party uh, forcing other parties to adopt some of their policies, um, forcing them to adopt maybe a more illiberal approach to, to democracy than, than other par parties have previously done, noticeably, or noticeably uh, conservative parties. Um, but, but overall, that's sort of one of the main ideas that on average, if, if they're in opposition, where there's someone contained in the powers that they do have, uh, they, 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 they can have some some positive effects. Um, that's, at least for some people, and that's also something we encountered in the review process might be a bit counterintuitive for, for most people. Right, so I mean, the, the main takeaway there is that it, it's not kind of a given conclusion, you know, when populists enter government, then this and this happens. There's always a bit of a, almost like a, it's almost conditional, right? There's other factors that come in uh, and play a, a significant role oftentimes. And that's where uh, that you guys have also done quite a bit of work. In, in various papers, you highlight, for example, the role of ideology, that that can play a very important um, factor in determining how populist parties really affect democracy. Or if you extend it a little bit, or, or more generally speaking, um, there's a lot of moderating uh, factors that kind of uh, shape or that can kind of condition, like I said earlier, this particular effect that populism has on democracy. So I wonder if you could maybe highlight a couple of those factors that play a role and kind of elaborate on them. Absolutely. So I think our work highlights at least three factors, and uh, Christian also tapped into one already. Um, so let me maybe start by talking about government power and this 
opposition government uh, dichotomy, right? And I mean, clearly, populist parties don't turn evil all of a sudden when they're in the government, but simply they have the opportunity to implement their vision of democracy, which may be at odds with liberal democracy, right? It's something they can't do when they're in opposition or only through indirect uh, ways. But um, this is not to say that uh, the mobilizing effect of populist parties, for example, vanishes the one stand in government. I think the relative weight of these different positive and neg negative effects may may shift depending on on um, the the role in the political system. Uh, plus, it really may depend on who are they governing with and what is kind of the issue area that we're looking at, right? Uh, if they are in coalition with a substantially stronger partner or in a surplus government where their support is not even necessary to uphold the government, then they may have substantially less influence. If we think of Switzerland, for example, where quite large majority governs the country for quite some time now, um, the SVP has a substantially smaller impact potentially than think of the Austrian Freedom Party, which is in in government with uh, the UVP and there's very little room to, to seek alternative uh, coalitions, right? So this power aspect really plays a role. How much can they demand in negotiations? Uh, how much can they force, even if they're the smaller partner, other coalition partners or the major coalition partner to, to make concessions to them, give them what they want, right? Um, so this is really an important point and something where we need to think uh, quite a lot about whether this is uh, important. Another aspect is consolidation of the democratic system. Quite often we cite the same three, four cases if we think about the negative impact of populism on democracy, right? There's always this Hugo Chavez example. There's always Fidesz and uh, maybe peace in Poland at the moment, right? And those are extreme cases, clearly, right? Um, and then on the other hand, if we think about cases like um, the US, for example, we see that consolidation may potentially limit the effect that populists may have on, on the political system, right? One could argue that the Republicans had Trump in, in office, had the Supreme Court and had the majority in the House, uh, in, the, in the, the Congress. But for the first two years, they weren't really able to completely derail the political system, right? even though they had fairly quote unquote absolute power at the time. Um, so there is some level of consolidation that may mediate and um, mitigate some of the negative effects of populists, right? Um, the more stable the system is, the more checks and balances we see, but maybe also the more socialized citizens are in what democracy means, the less likely it may be that populists are really capable of completely derailing the political system. And potentially, but this is a speculation and maybe of interest for future research, there is a reason why we say these more extreme cases of populist government in Eastern Europe, right? Where we have less of a liberal democratic uh, tradition compared to, to um, Central or Western European countries. Um, this could be one case. So uh, those two factors, who are the governing with, with how much power do they have, but also how consolidated is the political system overall may already moderate the effect of populism. Then clearly you tapped into ideology, but let me hand over to Christian for that. Thanks. Um, no, those are all, all, all very interesting points that, that we've looked at, but one of the, in, in one of our last papers, which has been quite a while actually, uh, what, what we really looked into was, well, populism doesn't just occur in a vacuum, right? And it, it occurs across the ideological spectrum. Uh, we got obviously some quote unquote left wing populism cases that, that are very famous in Latin America. We got right wing populism, which is more the variety that we'd see say in Poland, Hungary, the US, well, a lot of countries actually, you could go on and on. Well, what we thought about is, well, or if, if you look at it on the surface there, they actually have very, different notions of, for example, of who the people are, right? The left-wing populism comes from it, or comes to it more from an economic perspective where, where it's more inclusive, it's more sort of a class-based approach almost, but it's very inclusive. It's not 
like you know minorities such as immigrants need, need to be excluded whereas right-wing populists have all of a sudden an ethno it's an ethno-nationalism approach where it's very clear who belongs and who doesn't belong and for those people who look who don't belong what why should they be part of any democratic process because their their, their opinions are basically irrelevant so what we thought about was well if we think about populism it really sort of is, is a black and white picture where populism either has positive or negative effects um but it doesn't matter whether they are left-wing or right-wing populism we, we didn't find that very convincing which is why we looked at um left-wing populist parties and right-wing populist parties in Europe separately. Um, because it would make sense if, if, if pluralism and minority rights are a cornerstone to global democracy, why is it that left-wing populism should have any negative effects if they're, they're truly that inclusive as we think they are? And uh, at least what we found empirically was that for, for minority rights, left-wing populism wasn't, I don't, I don't even know if it was positive, but it wasn't, it was not negative, which is what we find for right-wing populism, which sort of opens the question then, well, for some of those relationships that we've posited uh, going back into the literature, is this is this then really about populism and should we make further distinctions? Um, there's also more work, again, if we're in a box or some, some other work that's really interesting that also then distinguishes left-wing populists from right-wing populists from center populists, where you sort of get a, get a completely different picture. Um, so what, what we think also what's what's worth thinking about is how much currency do we actually give to populism at least for some of the me mechanisms i mean overall we still posit that, that populism is opposed to, to to pluralism but perhaps we have to tone it down a bit depending on what we're looking at uh so certainly there, there's more to be done um there's also a recent work maybe we can put a put a link between or on the, in the youtube channel there um, that also finds that uh, for some of the left-wing populist parties like Syriza, for instance, once they actually get in, in government, they toned down their, their populist element quite distinctively, that they almost moved away from it, whereas sort of the ethno-nationalist populist parties that we see or populist radical right or radical populist right or whatever your preferred terminology is, they actually maintain that because it seems to make sense to go to go with it because they have this ethno-nationalist uh, distinction. But But all of this is to say that uh, we shouldn't just brush all, or not all populist parties are the same, um, leaving a bit the question how much currency we actually give to populism when we sort of kind of consider this ambivalent relationship. Maybe let me just briefly jump in here and um, also make this point that this is to some extent also about causal inference more generally, right? Uh, if we think of minority rights, it really seems that the host ideology of a populist party seems to dominate to some extent, right? That left-wing parties are substantially more positive than right-wing populist parties. In our recent study that you, you know cited, the, the 2017 uh, piece in Politics and Governance, um, we also find that both types of populist parties oppose mutual constraints, right? So that there is this element of checks and balances that they still oppose. And this seems to be the same for left and right and populist parties are fairly similar. But when we look at other issue areas or dimensions, this looks different, right? So this really is about thinking about the causal relationship. What is about populism? If we make this link back to what we talked in the beginning about um, the definition of populism and um, to what extent is this a function of some co-constituent terms such as ideology, for example, right? All right, so that's a that's a very good point, right? Because then maybe we can even take it one step further, Robert, and ask the question like, so what? If if it's maybe in a lot of cases not populism and it's actually something else, like if if that is not the primary driver, then then what might be? Or even perhaps even even to go back to the original question that I asked, what's the relationship really between democracy and, and populism? Is there some kind of negative or anti relationship between these two, um, or is it, you know, is it something else? Are there other factors here that uh, that perhaps drive this particular relationship? So, tell me maybe a little bit about to what extent you see populism actually being adverse to democracy or even pushing a democracy 
um, to the extent where it might become a non-democracy? Uh, absolutely. So obviously, I mean, it's a bit of a gray area because what we're talking about here on the one hand is radical parties, which some of populist parties are, um, and extremist parties, which by definition, by what they do, are, are opposed to, to democracy. It, it's quite a gray area. But I'd say a lot of parties are sort of going back and forth between between the two, uh, because certainly maybe some of the pop, maybe some of those parties are fishing for people that have more, more extremist views. Although at least in some countries that 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 that's fairly limited. But uh, CB actually touched on a good point. It's sort of so what's what's the actual what what's like, I suppose the question we can also rephrase it and ask: Well, what's the role of populism and all of this if you have sort of all those terms float or all those parts floating around ideology democracy parties what's what's sort of the role of populism here and obviously what we what we came from was that to, to think about populism as, as a set of ideas but as as we well know that's not the only idea of populism that we could subscribe to um so to maybe make, make references or make reference to, to Bart Bonakowski's work once again he he'd argued that that populism or, or his premise is that populism is a form of discourse that authoritarian leaders used to mobilize and gain support, get into government, um, maybe use it as a justification for pointing out problems for discrediting the elite, but but in and by itself they're authoritarian leaders, right? So it's populism is an is an instrument that might get parties that are truly opposed to democracy or at the very least, liberal democracy in, into a position where where, where, where they can then uh, wheel and deal to 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 get democracy off the rail and establish you know, competitive authoritarianist regime or whatever your authoritarian regime looks like. Um, so I, I I think maybe one of the questions is then you know. Is there, or at least now we're at a stage where we do have more empirical evidence, and I think it doesn't just apply to the area of democracy, but also electoral politics, um, where maybe we, we could look back, right? Because before we've sort of embraced this this pluralism of definitions, you know, populism can be a discourse or a frame, but sort of go to this area, populism is a set of ideas. And there's also people that say, you know, Tarkis Papas would argue, well, it's actually very distinct regime preference, and maybe Obinati would be in the same camp, it's sort of a liberal democracy. But maybe we can actually go back now and look at some of the empirical evidence to see, okay, well, we now we've gathered the empirical evidence. So, so what is it? Is it is it that populism sort of pops up as something negative for, for liberal democracy because it's a push for a different democratic idea altogether, um, at least based on some of the things I've that we've read or we've cited, I'd say that the, the evidence might be a bit more limited. Uh, is it because it's, your populism is sort of an ideal or an idea on the society level, and it just glorifies a majoritarian system, possibly? Or and this goes back to the aforementioned Bonakowski article: Is it that it's just an instrument that that people use? So there's sort of you know, it seems to be correlating with democratic quality, but what it really is, is, is an instrument for, you know, ethnocentric or ethno, ethno-nationalist parties or authoritarian leaders to, to get into a position where they can, where they can unravel democracy. And I, I think we all agree that, that more work could be done in this area, um, because it would be an, a very interesting question if you, if you think about it, not just embracing the pluralism of, of ideas, but actually distinctively testing those three ideas against each other or, or looking back at the empirical evidence that we have. Mm, absolutely. Maybe let me also jump in here and, and make two points. So, so, so one is maybe more on the party level, because most of what we talked about now is, is party level uh, of, of party politics, if we want. Um, there is this interesting idea by, by Kass and, and Christopher again in the 2017 book, where they kind of make this argument that the equilibrium of uh, the, the vision of a populist democracy is not liberal, but also democratic, right? And so they would argue that uh, in an authoritarian regime, populism would push for more democracy, but in a liberal democratic regime, they would push for less democracy or less liberal democracy. 
However, we don't really know this. We don't have very systematic evidence. Would this mean that, for example, fetus or a piece would stop now with the transformation of the system, or would they go full authoritarian, right? And we don't quite know yet. We don't have enough cases at the moment. We have a couple of cases like, like uh, Chavez and Venezuela, for example, where we may be a bit skeptical about this, this argument, right? But so we definitely need to understand a bit better where does this all stop, right? If, if populism is this glorified uh, vision of a majoritarian system, this would imply that there, there is some form of democracy in there, right? Um, and, and that's clearly an interesting question. And maybe we're a bit unfortunate to be able to observe this in the European Union. Um, but this is definitely an interesting question. Where will Peter, for example, stop, right? How un undemocratic do they want to go? Um, the other question that's really important, I think, is what about citizens, right? I mentioned this before in terms of uh, consolidation and to some extent citizens in democratic regimes being a, a poten potential hindrance to the implementation of the populist idea of democracy. But we know very little at the moment about how do citizens think of democracy, right? There are a couple of studies here and there. Andreas Sasselov and colleagues, for example, did a bit of work here, and we see um, the populists are more willing to support uh, direct democracy, for example. But, but clearly, and from all the debate that we have, this is a fairly complex thing to measure both populism on the individual level, right? What's the best way of measuring populist attitudes? And I think there is at least one um, episode of this video series dedicated to this, right? Um, but then also, how can we measure this multifaceted, com uh, complex phenomenon of liberal democracy on the citizen level and have clear predictions? Would we expect that what we find for, say, right-wing populists on the party level to perfectly mirror what citizens think? We don't quite know yet, right? And it's not only about the supply that parties give, but to some extent, it's also about what do citizens want. And I, I guess this is the second larger step next step that uh, um, Christian and I anticipate that we need more research to get a better understanding of what's going on here. And this is clearly a question of um, how to measure populist attitudes, how to measure liberal democracy, but also getting cross-country empirical data that we can use and analyze, right? Um, so I think there is, is a lot going on. And there's a, a lot of interesting research out there at the moment tapping into when are citizens, for example, willing to vote for illiberal candidates? Um, and, and I think those are really important questions where we need more evidence as the next steps to get a more complete picture of how do populist parties, populist citizens, and democracy relate, and how much of a threat, but also how much of a corrector can it be? And I think that both of your research, I think, is very foundational in studying that particular uh, relationship. So I think that's something that uh, a lot of people are going to keep going back to is the, the joint collaborative work that you guys have been putting out there for quite some time now. And I guess to end on a good note is we're going to have plenty of empirical examples of populism in power and successful populism to test all these different ideas and ideologies or uh, sorry, ideas and questions uh, that we just touched upon. Uh, so let, it, let me end here, Robert. Uh, Christian, thank you very much uh, for giving us your time. Thank you.